Hello everyone and welcome to issue number 81 of Anti-Life Reviews. This month we're going to be looking at some of the works of someone who is no longer with us in one Mr. Darwin Cook. So I'm going to be going over his DC Comics epic in The New Frontier with both volumes covering issues 1 through 6 in its totality. Published from March 2004 to November 2004. So let's go ahead and move right along and get into it. Of course you know the shtick. Please subscribe. I can't do this out with a little support from you people out there. Writer and artist on this is one singular person. That's Mr. Darwin Cook. Has been awarded just about every major comic book honor that one can imagine. Supremely talented man that not only worked on a number of comics and animated series, a good portion for the DC Comics brand. It reminds me a bit of Will Eisner of the Spirit fame, which is no shocker there as we will see a Spirit comic this month with Darwin drawing it. Sadly, Mr. Cook passed away in 2006 after a lengthy battle with cancer. You are missed, sir. Now, this is more framed as a sort of history of the DC Universe in compact form than an actual narrative. A little bit like Marvel's, but I'll go over that at the comparison later. So, my synopsis is just going to be to hit the bullet points. So, we start with issues one through three. We start with the We Losers, a Marine Corps group led by Colonel Richard Flagg. And they are stuck on Dinosaur Island, losing men rapidly to, well, dinosaurs. Until it's just one Johnny Cloud, Colonel Flagg, and the dog Pooch that are all that's left. In the end, Flagg escapes, and Johnny Cloud dies, taking out a T-Rex. Johnny Cloud was a loser to the very end. We then get a brief rundown of how World War II affected and transformed the DC Universe. World War II ushered in a new wave of heroes, but after it ended, the Cold War came and the Red Panic. So faith in heroes went right down the tubes. The JSA disbanded, most of them retiring. But there were plenty of active heroes now, but they have been deemed vigilantes in their own right. It doesn't stop them from from helping around the world, where tensions continue to brew. We see characters active in, in the Korean War, such as fighter pilot Hal Jordan and Lois Lane and Jimmy Olsen as reporters. Hal sees some serious action there, and we also see Superman and Wonder Woman helping to curb some of the tensions in Indochina. Yeah, that goes well. The interesting story about Wonder Woman freeing some women who are being held as slaves and letting them kill the men who imprison them. They become her little army. Superman is not amused by it, but it's pretty badass in my opinion. We then meet for the first time, canonically, the Martian Manhunter, summoned from space by a call. The seemingly last Martian begins to acclimate to the human world. He likes soda pop. He can shapeshift. We get some fun panels of him being Groucho Marx and Bugs Bunny until he finds a human form. That of a noir gumshoe detective and a name. John Jones. He becomes a very effective cop. The remainder of the first volume is sort of a compendium of events more fit for annotations than really a store with forward progression. Apparently Batman fights some cultists, saving a young boy and finding a key he gives to John Jones. Challenges of the Unknown are formed, a shocking, shockingly downplayed team in the history of comics. They begin to astound the public. More dramatically, John Henry is born, out to take revenge in the KKK who tried to hang him. Wildcat beats Cassius Clay for the heavyweight title. Don't love that. At the after party for the fight at a casino, Captain Cold tries to rob everybody. We get to meet his eternal adversary here, the fastest man al alive, the Flash, who of course foils Cold and his unnecessary elaborate traps. Hal Jordan has vivid dreams of an accident to come, begins his work at Ferris Air as an expert pilot, unafraid of anything. In love with the boss's daughter, he learns that Ferris Air wants to head into space and is working for NASA secretly. Finally, Batman learns the truth of John Jones, confronting him, and a short time later, Jones learns about something mysterious and dangerous called the Center. Issues 4 through 6. Barry Allen, the Flash, fights Gorilla Grodd, but it's a ruse as the government tries to capture him. He essentially retires then. John Jones continues to investigate the Center, and a series of very strange things happen in the world. This leads to a run-in with the government, who knows that he landed on Earth, though they don't know it's him, and he finds out the government is planning a trip to Mars via Ferris Air. And of course, who's up to the job? The original Task Force X, which will much, much later be known as the Suicide Squad. But they have a special pilot with them, one Hal Jordan, though this ends pretty quickly due to woe differences, and he's put in the doghouse at Ferris Air. We get an incredible and frankly very upsetting scene. Might be the best in all of this. We get John Henry on the run from the KKK. He's hurt, he's dying, he's been fighting. He's at the, at the house in rural Tennessee, and there's this little girl that finds him. There's tension, a real moment, where he takes off his mask, and she has these big eyes just looking at him. And she calls out for the KKK where, where he's at, and he says, you know, there's N-words here. And John Henry was killed. 
and the nation rightly mourns as we get a TV-style overview of his history. He was John Wilson. His wife, Lucille, and daughter, Loretta, were killed by the KKK and the local police. He became a vigilante to fight, so no one ever had to lose their family to the horrors of racism again. Somehow moving on from that, uh, John Joan gives his research about the Senate to Batman before heading off to get on the rocket going to Mars. Task Force X is ready for launch with Colonel Flagg and Hal Jordan making amends. As they launch, John tries to sneak on, but an FBI agent confronts him, and John saves the man instead of getting on the ship, and John is captured. And there are further problems with the rocket. They have no fuel and are sort of floating around in space, but can't make it back in time. The challenges of the unknown are on it, and at first Superman is unreachable, but ultimately the Man of Steel arrives. And there's a really beautiful moment where Karen Grace and Rick Flagg, people on the ship, thinking about the life they had and the life they could have had, and the panel work is astounding. They prepare to die. They are seemingly saved by Superman, but no. He's too late. And we get the aftermath of their funeral, A Dark Day. We then get a brief retelling of Hal Jordan becoming the Green Lantern. We see the ring changing him, talking to him. He explores his new abilities, his strength, how his imagination affects things. Dinosaurs begin popping up around the world. We learn about the center. It's a sentient being that fell to Earth. Mm -hmm. It liked the dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. It doesn't like man so much. It's going to change man's rule. Pretty standard villain stuff from space. Leads to a cute moment, the first meeting between Superman and Robin, as Batman discusses the center. All over the country there is mass dread, like a Lovecraft story, and strange dinosaurs begin to attack all over the world, signaling the center is making his move. One woman's invisible plane is damaged. Superman uh, manages to take down one of the beasts, but it doesn't matter as the center rises. A towering mass from the ocean spewing fire and hate with an army of strange dinosaur creatures following. It dismantles the U.S. Navy quickly. We then head into the end game. Barry gets his mojo back. John and the government come to terms. And all the superheroes we can we can pack join up, including Superman, Wonder Woman, Batman, Green Arrow, the Blackhawks, Challenge of the Unknown, and of course, Hal Jordan, the Green Lantern. Superman is taken out by the center almost instantly. Magic folks debate if they help and decide to. Thanks, guys. We then get everyone come to terms with each other and an Armageddon-style walking page. Then down to the hot, hot action for some time. An awesome Hal Jordan 2001, Jack Kirby, Jim Starlin style psychedelic stuff happens and Hal ends up saving the day, sending the sender away, seemingly defeated. Aquaman arrives, saving an injured Superman, meeting the non-Atlantis world for the first time. We then get narration with President Kennedy in his famous New Frontier speech. Over this we see the future looming for the superheroes, no longer vigilantes, they become a staple of the world. We see the Joker's arrival, Lex Luke Luthor's looming over industry, John Irons admiring the late John Henry, and finally, the arrival of the Justice League of America, facing down Starro together as a team for the first time. Okay, so let's go over the art first. Darwin is an amazing artist. He captures the sense of golden age beauty mixed with a more modern line work and action that is really unique. His panel layouts are astounding, and you know, I'm, I'm such a panel whore. I'm very picky about it, but it's just this, this kinetic panels that were used appropriately. Be they full page spreads, multi panel pages, etc. Coloring was so vivid, and just the whole book jumps out at you. Every page is art you could frame. And then, what positive thing to say about the art? Cook captured the beginning of the DC universe so well, including many, many iconic moments you may or may not know. Also, much like Alex Ross, he threw a lot of famous people in there. Bing Crosby, Peter Lorre, people of that ilk, through and through, and it was a lot of fun. And there are some points in this, the de death of Task Force X, Hal Jordan getting his powers, the closing moments, the Superman meeting Raman that were very, very well framed. It was nice to see these wonderful pieces of history, uh, but one really stood out, and I wish it could have gotten more coverage, more love, was the story of John Henry. Heartbreaking, just staggeringly hard to read and presented a stark reality to the world at the time that I like to think things have changed, but sometimes it's difficult to see the forest through the trees, but excellently done. As are things kind of fall apart for me. This feels more like annotations to the DC Universe than it does a story with any real structure. There's certainly a through line with the center in John Jones, but besides that, it's a very bloated version of Marvel's, which had a lot of Marvel history packed in, but kept the stories contained within pieces of that history while peppering in other things around it for fun. This was just, you could probably tell from my overview, jumping from things that happened in the pre-GLA uh, JLA DC. And it's amazing because it, it, it gets the time and date of everything correct. It works. It's just not very interesting as a comprehensive comic story. If it had been the early history of DC, I wouldn't have this complaint, but it's just a compendium of timeline events. It reads, flankly, frankly, slightly masturbatory, as if Mr. Cook just really wanted to talk about DC history to a compulsive degree. 
Trust me, I understand that feeling. And it's funny because it's described as a Hal Jordan comic, but he gets little to do here. He wasn't that interesting. We know his history, and it adds nothing really compelling to the mythos. Speaking of not compelling, the center was a generic, uninteresting, unfulfilling character who had like 50 pages devoted to the fight, and it was really exhausting. Like, we get it. Come on, I don't need to put you to pad this. And that's certainly what it felt like. Overall, this was real, and, and this should be my catchphrase, a real mixed bag. It was ambitious and beautiful and well done, but not overall terribly interesting. As a piece of art, it works. As a comic, it's just kind of there for people who appreciate the Golden Age, and for not many others, to be frank. And while I do love the Golden Age, or right, Golden Age comes frequently than you might might imagine I do, I don't need a timeline of it. I see it up there with Watchmen and Dark Knight Returns and Kingdom Come, and I just I don't agree with that assessment. It's interesting more than it is good. I'll say, honestly, the new Frontier animated film, which came out in 2008, uh, was kind of, I liked it better. It, it cut a lot of the fat and gave a more streamlined cohesive story, and Darwin worked on that one, but I think he was on a leash, as it were. I think they let Darwin run away with his comic a little bit too much, but yeah, you can read this, it's kind of historic, but unless you're into superheroes into that era, you might not get much from it. Well, that was it for the first of this month's Darwin Cook comics with The New Frontier. Who's your favorite Golden Age character no one talks about? Let me know down below. Let's head to my Instagram under Demon Peaks for daily daily Twin Peaks memes. Check my podcast, Dark Peaks Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe. I'll check out my Patreon. I did change things around on it. It's a little bit different, a little more interesting. And come back next week as we look at Batman Ego. This has been Ethan Makaya, Master of Minds and Men. Thank you very much, and goodbye. Mm-hmm.